My topic tonight is challenging revision surgery, tips and tricks and, and principles for how to approach that type of surgery. So I wanted to actually start, um, before we get into our cases, I wanted to, to give a very general talk on some of the things I've learned in my first, I'm seven years into practice and I do tumor, tumor surgery and, and uh, really all kinds of degenerative and deformity spine surgery. So um, the, the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way have been partially self-taught through a lot of pain, but also um, really through the support of my mentors, um, you know, Dr. Singh, Dr. Phillips, Dr. Ahn, DeWald, Goldberg, and um, just our, our, our excellent uh, faculty. So hopefully we can communicate some of that and use it as a jumping off point to, to talk about um, some of our cases. So as a background, you know, obviously spinal fusion as a DRG and as a, as a general procedure is, is, has skyrocketed over the past two decades. Um, we also have a rising age incidence in this country and therefore, um, you know, spinal fusion surgery in people above 65 has increased almost 140% by volume over the past 10 years. But, you know, let's not forget anybody that does spine surgery knows that spine surgery is hard. And so revisions are a part of spine surgery. Um, other specialties may have um, people that choose to focus on primary surgery or revision surgery. Um, I don't believe that spine surgery allows that. I think if you're going to be a spine surgeon, you're going to be a competent spine surgeon, you need to be able to handle revisions. And um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So, so let's say you, you see a patient you believe needs further surgery and has had surgery. So we're in a revision setting. How do we tackle that? How do we prepare to, to have that case go well? Well, I think my first, my first principle that I've, I've, I've picked up um, in my short time practicing is really to, to, to go back in time. I want to know what, the, what was the patient's problem before they had their index surgery? Was that surgeon um, or was that, was that operation that they had um, likely to be successful? And did they just simply suffer a complication or a known progression of their underlying disease? Or um, were they, was it sort of doomed from the start? I think that's important to know when you're deciding on whether or not to go at it again. The second principle is let's understand what's really wrong. So it's most of the, you know, most of the bear traps I've seen people fall into really involve um, treating radiographs and MRI findings um, and, and not so much treating the patient's clinical problem. So we really need to understand um, what are the patient's symptoms. We need to listen to the patient's um, and we need to, and we need to really develop a strategy um, to address their actual symptoms and clinical problem, but also link that um, together with their radiographic findings and their other studies and sort of come up with a unified um, diagnosis before we start trying to treat it. So I, I tend to use a checklist and I try to consider, um, you know, patients that have had previous instrumentation, certainly instrumentation failure is a, is a possible cause for failure. Instrumentation malplacement is a, is a huge one. Um, and, and even some unique device failures, disc arthroplasty can fail, um, expandable cages can fail. Um, so, that, so the actual function of the device can be an issue. Um, what about the first surgery having an inadequate decompression? Well, that happens more than you'd think. Um, I, I think probably one of the number one reasons for revision surgery in my practice is um, someone had spine surgery, but it just really didn't create neural decompression in an effective way. And that's, that's the reason for them needing to go back. Um, certainly rare causes like infection are, are, are good to think about. Pseudarthrosis, did the patient not heal? I've seen so many, you know, um, very clean looking MRIs. And if you really investigate dynamic films and CT scans, you'll find, you'll find a, a real lack of healing and the, the, the haloing and the motion doesn't need to be dramatic to cause really significant symptoms going forward. So pseudarthrosis and failure to, failure to fuse in the presence of implants is a huge cause for revision. Certainly adjacent segment, so um, stenosis or instability above or below prior constructs. And the one I hate is, you know, complications or, or handling of the original surgery. So the surgeon that did the index surgery is really the only person that knows how that surgery went. And so 
uh, this is a diagnosis of exclusion, but some cases just present with, with neural trauma, you know, neural neuropraxia from stretch, from, from derotomy, from a whole host of, you know, from instrumentation placement. And I think you have to have this in your mind. It's something I discuss with patients in a, obviously a very uh, political, politically correct kind of way, but some problems are not fixable with more surgery and we need to understand that. So this is a, a kind of interesting case of mine that I, I thought was illustrative of sort of how to think hard about what the actual problem is. I, I, don't, I don't think I actually really knew what the problem was for a long time evaluating this patient. Um, but it's a patient that did well after a standalone ALIF for foraminal stenosis a long time ago. And a surgeon, um, I put a post-op x-ray there on the right. So a, a surgeon, focus on this x-ray on the left. A, a surgeon actually did an MIST lift. And the first, the first thing I, I noticed when I looked at this MIST lift is, well, you know, the screws don't look like they have huge halos. They don't look loose or broken. The cage is massive and it's, you know, a monoblock or um, sort of a, uh, uh, um, sort of an all titanium uh, spacer that has definitely subsided into that caudal end plate. I don't really see much healing and the patient's, you know, nine months out from the surgery doing quite poorly, mostly from a neurologic standpoint with left leg radiculopathy. So really, really a, a, a reasonable patient and a, and a searing radiculopathy that I just sort of couldn't figure out. Um, the MRI looked really, really clean. I didn't feel like there was a ton of haloing or loosening of the screws, but if you actually look at these two CT cuts, this MIST lift was done rather than being, rather than involving sort of like an IEP re resection, SAP resection and exposure of Kamen's triangle. This, this approach came really outside. It came in the lateral border of the facet and there was still SAP osteophyte, IAP osteophyte and, and, and lateral ligamentum causing a, a pretty good amount of stenosis that just was hard to see on the MRI scrolling through the MRI. So I didn't really realize that is what, what the case was until I, until I went in and I hate exploratory surgery, but this was a, a reasonable patient with very clear symptoms. And I, I, I my hypothesis going in was pseudarthrosis, but I, when I actually went in, I, I found all this, this stenosis was sort of hard to detect on imaging. So just a nice example of, of, um, and she did very well after I revised the decompression. So Matthew, nice. you weren't worried about iatrogenic nerve injury from that approach? Was the history um, that, that she was better for a while and then got worse again? Yeah, yeah, correct. Exactly. I think if I hadn't been been so suspicious of motion and pseudarthrosis, I wouldn't have been in there for another surgery. And I think I sort of just got lucky identifying what the actual problem was. But I, I 100% agree. I think if, you're, if your diagnosis of exclusion is is iatrogenic nerve injury, then you really shouldn't be taking that patient back, so. And, and Matt, was this patient's main complaint leg pain or back pain? Certainly both, but, okay. but, but a very prominent component of left leg pain, unilateral leg pain. Yeah, On because- side of you the know, her, insertion. her canal looks pretty, pretty wide open. Totally, totally. And that's why, that's why I'm showing it, because I, I just thought it was, it was very hard to figure out what the real problem here was. And I, I don't think I, I, again, I think I humbly, got kind of lucky with identifying the problem. But I said, if I'm going to go in and, and, and revise the, the fusion and do an open posterior lateral fusion, which is what I did, I'm going to do a really thorough decompression. I'm going to look at the nerves from the canal because I've seen a fair amount of MIS surgery that that's still, you know, it's, there are, there is, there is actually residual neural compression despite a pretty good looking MRI. So um, that's what I did. And I, this is what, that's what I found. And I, I, Felt like is we five were. is five one pseudoed? It looks like on the CT that <laughs> five one didn't heal. It really does. No, I I, I the facets were pretty well fused, and and uh, I didn't think you know uh, based on the CT that it was much much more healed than that four five T lift. I agree that cut does look a little sketchy. <clears throat> so, um, you know, what if you still don't? What if you still can't figure this out? Well. I mean, when we make a checklist, we, we're really making a, a differential diagnosis and we should order tests that, that help us narrow that diagnosis. So I use a lot of in these revision settings to try to figure out which route and which level is the problem. 
I use a lot of selective nerve root blocks to try to understand what the diagnostic effect of that is. Um, I use bone scans to, to try to highlight areas of arthropathy and bone turnover. Um, and certainly, you know, most difficult to figure out cases should be evaluated with both an MRI and a CT because I just think the bony, you know, the bony detail shows you things that the MRI can't. Um, so let's just talk about a, some common, some of the scenarios that come up and some of the tips and tricks. I'm going to try to move through this quickly so we can get to the cases. So pearls for exposure and revision in the revision setting. So, you, you know, when you, the worst thing you can do is to go from skin down through fascia and create this very thick wall that's hard to close. So I try to, I try to make an effort to define the fascia layer and that's a plastic surgery trick. I mean, it's, it's essentially making a flap. Sometimes you actually have to create it but I try to develop that on my way down. Um, you should make long incisions. You shouldn't do acute exposures in, in revision surgery. Um, I like to work from really virgin territory, high and low, and then work into the middle. Um, that establishes depth that prevents um, uh, leaving an excessive amount of tissue on the middle of the spine. And it just helps create confidence because you're not working in an unknown zone. I, again, that's part and parcel with avoiding the Indian burial, burial mound, as we call it, um, leaving a bunch of tissue over the canal. Of course, all that tissue then comes out as you do the compression or decompression. At least a lot of it comes out and it creates a potential space, which I think is a, a, a nidus for um, um, certainly seroma, draining wounds and, and potentially infection. Um, my opinion, my personal opinion on plastic, involving plastic surgery is that it's a great thing to do. It's a great way to build um, multidisciplinary camaraderie right off the bat with your, with your colleagues in your institution. I don't tend to do it all that regularly. Um, but I think if you're going to involve them, the time to involve them is time zero, not once you have a wound problem. So just, just some comments. Does anybody, does, does anybody regularly involve plastics in their revisions here? Not, not regularly, but it just depends on, you know, the patient and the amount of preview. They had a lot of times they had multiple revisions and yeah, that, you know, there's no viable tissue to go down through the different planes. Right. Right. And it's, you know, I worry a lot about posterior cervical and just areas that don't have a lot of room for error. Um, how about in removing instrumentation? So I'll lean on my reps. I'll send them x-rays ahead of time and see if, you know, if I, don't, if I can't identify the instrumentation, which has become more and more rare, um, that they can often help. There's certainly, um, tomes of, you know, that, that list a lot of different old x-rays of different instrumentation. I actually tend to use the universal removal set more and more and more. Like I don't even really go, I mean, I look for the old op report and stuff, but a lot of times it's not findable. And so I'm pretty comfortable with a universal removal set getting me through most instrumentation removals. Um, if I can't, the best thing to do is a helicopter. Most of the fellows listening are familiar with the helicopter strategy where you just have to use a you have to cut the rod above and below the, the set screw or just um, put a little mini rod in an open tool up and then put a set screw down that converts the screw to a uniaxial screw essentially. And, and then you can um, use a counter torque or there's even some specific devices that allow you to helicopter out of any screw. Um, broken screws. I don't fish for a lot unless I really, really need the fixation in that pedicle, but certainly tre trefining and using reverse threads to get those out is a good maneuver. I wanted I to just, know. Oh, go ahead. I don't know. I don't know what you tell your fellows, but my fellows have heard this every year is no one looks cool doing hardware removals. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, that, our fellows don't look cool anyway, but yes, I agree, especially in hard. Just joking, guys. Um, so I wanted to just make a couple comments about the bogeys because I've been in cases where these are the pedicle screw systems that you're like, ah, when you find them in there and you didn't realize it ahead of time. It can be challenging. So, the TSR, the old TSRH um, instrumentation is pretty futzy. Um, it's really helpful to have specific instrumentation to get this out. You don't need it because it's really just sort of a posted screw with a with a nut cross connector. But if you're not, if you don't know that it's that that's what you're going in after, it, you know you're not and you're not prepared. It can be a little bit painful. I think CD rods. So I made a picture of the CD rod, old CD rods. Those are seven O rods. So a lot of times if you're doing a deformity uh, revision or extending it, you need a special connector to link 5.5 five to 7.0. So, and those for a while, like we're out of stock, you can get them. I think some companies are making them more and more again. So we have them back in stock, but I, I was in a case where 
where uh, we didn't have the connectors. We ran out. I thought we had them in our revision caddy tray and we didn't have them and it was painful. So that's something to keep in mind is that old seat, those, those knurled rods with um, sort of some texture to them. They're seven Oh, not six, not quarter inch. So that can be an issue. Um, certainly it's embarrassing when you go in after this, these, these uh, set screwless systems like K2 Mesa. Um, I've, I've been kicking myself several times for not seeing that ahead of time. It's just poor attention to detail. So those, those really do need proprietary uh, removal unless you're going to helicopter every screw. And then uh, Striker Z is one of the thorns in my side over the, the years as well, because it has this multi sort of nipple screw extraction that often isn't in the universal removal set, although some do have it. So just a couple notes on some of the screw systems that have frustrated me trying to get out. Um, certainly not intended to be comprehensive, but just you gotta, you gotta think about what you're taking out ahead of time. Revision decompression, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll define the bony sidewall very carefully with just by going down with Bovi onto facet and pars. Um, I'll use large curettes to scrape them off. Don't try to take bites, thick bites with a kerosene in the revision setting. Try to drill as much as you can and thin the bone ahead of time. Um, I don't like, I don't tend to use the harmonic scalpel just because I think it's very slow. Um, but some people think this is very useful for delicate areas. You're not going to harm the dura by coming through the bony sidewall with the harmonic. Um, I use that much more for osteotomies, PSOs and stuff. Um, but I think, I think big instruments are your friend in revision decompression. Probably my, my favorite revision move of all the moves is a, is a Howard on move. Um, and that's to take the largest metal curette that you, that you have and really try to work it inside the bony sidewall because the big metal, the big, large cupped curettes will push the scar away and the, the, the sharp leading edge will cut the wall and it just does not create dural tears. Uh, but sticking micro curettes and Woodson's in really does. So that's just my advice is to use big instruments. Um, and then just also know that that failed decompressions, you know, they're, they're usually not that thorough laterally. So if you just get out laterally and work around the stenosis, um, work out through the neuroframen and up and down, you don't need to come from the central canal out because that's how you get into trouble. Um, get into virgin territory where the nerve roots are in the, in the neuroframen. Um, so handling pseudarthrosis repair is a big skill. I think you need to do two things. You need to add biology and you need to add mechanical rigidity. So for biology, I could give a whole talk on this. So I'm just going to kind of gloss over it, but um, you have to think about osteoporosis because that impairs bony healing, not just create thin bone, but it actually impairs um, osteosynthesis. You need to consider using advanced biologics to augment your biology and autograft, especially. Um, I try to take out the old instrumentation as soon as humanly possible and reestablish the fusion bed. I think that just makes the case go much, much better. If you, if you try to revise the fusion around old screws, I find it very, very difficult. Um, and so the, the, I usually take all the screws out around the pseudoarthrosis and, and just get my virgin, you know, bone, bone bleeding again. Um, and then, you know, you have to pre-op plan with CT and really find the location of the pseudoarthrosis and really consider other, other fusion beds. I mean, can you employ an inner body graft to create a different fusion bed if you've completely failed to fuse in the posterior lateral gutter? You know, assess it, getting the mechanical rigidity, I, uh, again, another whole talk in and of itself, but we should understand the difference between accessory and satellite rods. Accessory is what we do when we run rods up and down the side and just cross connect them, but that's certainly not as good as a, sa a true satellite rod, which, which the definition of a satellite rod is that it goes into the segmental instrumentation and then you can cross connect to your um, other longer rods. So that's a common technique we'll employ in, in PSO closure and those kind of things, but it's much more strong than a, just a simple accessory. And um, you know, one of the, this is a, <clears throat> you can't see, but on the, but both of these rods on the left image are broken. And I revise that by linking in axially, but also using an accessory for a quad rod construct. That's kind of a very common move that I'll use to repair pseudarthrosis and create more mechanical rigidity. So I don't think, I guess the lesson is axial connectors and side to side connectors in isolation are, are not going to be strong enough to create the rigidity you need. Almost done. Um, Durotomy, um, in revision setting, primary repair is, is, is sometimes possible, but, but my experience is that a lot of the big durotomies are 
just atrophy of the dura the, the dura is just gone on the on the sidewall it could be an old tear that then expanded it could just be atrophy but um you know i try if i see a big actual defect I'll, I'll sew a patch on using a sort of like a suture shuttle technique um where all the sutures get placed ahead of time and then i kind of push the patch down onto the the repair um I don't try to make that airtight. I think it's it's really a, meant to protect the dura and to create a new healing surface. Um, what I think is really important is that your closure is the best closure of your life. Your your fascia has to be closed in multiple layers and it has to be really, really tight. I love a, a running uh, barbed suture over top of many interrupted sutures. Um, and I, I use nylon in the skin. Um, I still place drains because the only thing worse than a bad durotomy in a revision setting is a hematoma plus a bad durotomy and having to go back. Um, so I still use a drain, but I tend to put them to gravity. And there's a, there's a whole other talk there. Um, so sorry to gloss over these very important points. But um, last, last scenario is tumors. I know this is a little more esoteric, but in tumors, you have, to, you have to confirm your diagnosis and you have to restage the patient to make sure you understand is revision tumor surgery actually in their best interest given their systemic involvement. Um, of course, radical tumor surgery in the spine is always the best way to control a tumor, but there's usually a pretty high morbidity price with that. So a lot of times you're gonna be in intralesional territory and we'll show a case of that. But I, my thesis to you is that not all intralesional tumor surgery is the same. There's very thorough R1 type surgery where all gross tumor is removed, maybe not microscopic tumor. And then there's Interlesional surgery where some of it's removed and a lot of it stays and is uninterrupted and that will come back. So be careful and be thorough with interlesional tumor surgery and use your multidisciplinary team. I think, you know, the radiotherapy capabilities nowadays are very, have very much changed how aggressive we have to be with surgery. We can allow SRS and protons to really clean up a tumor bed, but it has to be done in the right mm -hmm. way, multidisciplinary planning. So uh, don't get derotomies with tumors because it gets in the central uh, across the blood brain barrier. So in summary, you know, revision surgery gets done for a very wide array of problems. This isn't meant to be comprehensive, but you got to understand why you're doing the revision and have very clear goals um, and try to make develop your skills that we've kind of talked about to make unpredictable operations more predictable and kind of have a routine. Um, thanks. Sorry, that went a little over. Let's uh, go to the next first case here. I'm going to, um, Matt, while we're going to one case, I just wanted to add a comment. Great uh, synopsis of all of that. The only thing that I would add and emphasize and what uh, I've been doing over the last number of years is staging a lot of these cases, uh, removing the hardware as part of stage one and getting cultures done uh, a lot of time. And when we uh, audited our cases, we found that there's a 13% incidence of occult infections that were not picked up with routine blood work and had to be grown out at least three weeks because they were growing these weird staphs or siacnes in them. And I just hate being blamed for those infections. And you go and do a great revision and then you still get a pseudarthrosis and you find out two months later or something that it's growing something that was there after the original surgery. So I don't hesitate to stage these revisions. It's a great point, especially in, in unexplained pseudos and those kind of things, you know, loose screws, you have halos at a bunch of different places. I think that's, uh, that's great. I, I should do that more often. Hey, we have Dr. Rush next. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Yeah. Hey everybody, my name is AJ. I'm one of the fellows here and I'll uh, be presenting a couple of deformity cases that we can kind of uh, compare and contrast. Sorry, let me get this out of the way here. So the first one's a 67 year old female. She had a previous L4 to S1 Lamy fusion for uh, lumbar radiculopathy uh, in 2003, so almost 10 years uh, prior to the surgery she received with us. Uh, she's having progressive low back pain, inability to maintain painless upright posturing, and she's really failed all um, 
modalities of conservative treatment for an extremely prolonged period of time. As far as her exam, it's relatively benign. She's uh, full strength, but painful lumbar range of motion, and she walks with a crouched pitch forward gait. She has no uh, knee or hip flexion contractures. So these are uh, some pre-op lumbar images. As you can see, she had the previous four to one uh, fusion. She has robust uh, fusion mass posterior laterally, but she's in uh, obviously a flat uh, position with uh, lack of lumbar lordosis. And here's her pelvic parameters. She has a mismatch of nearly 50 degrees. And uh, here we see her long films. And even though her SVA doesn't seem very big, she's retroverting her pelvis significantly. And you can just tell she has a um, significant flat back there. <clears throat> this is such a great, this is such a great case. Cause if you just look at that, go back one slide. One more. Yeah, here. just go, go back one more. Yeah, uh, and even one more. If you if you just look at her initial lumbar, you, you, you know you, you might say, "Boy, this doesn't look so bad." I mean, she looks like she's kind of looks like a lumbar spine. It looks like she's tilting back a little bit. One of the things I do when it, when you know when you start thinking about pelvic pelvic incidents and and PIL mismatch and and compensatory mechanisms for that, you know, sure. pelvic retroversion is one of the biggest ways people compensate for that. So. What I do is I actually kind of, I go, go forward one slide. Huh? I, I actually normalize the pelvic tilt. You know, her pelvic tilt is very big here. It's very retroverted, but I'll normalize it to let's say 20. And then I'll look at how the SVA looks then. And that's a really clear way to understand how, how much she's actually compensating for a very significant lumbar deformity, even though it doesn't look all that bad. And just also underscores the importance of long films. You can really, you can really understand a lot more once you look at a long film. All right, keep going. Here's just the MRI. She does have a little bit of stenosis at the uh, upper level at three, four, but otherwise uh, pretty good previous decompression. So she has a previous L4 to S1 fusion uh, and clinical and radiographic flat back syndrome. Uh, so I don't know if we want to stop here and uh, have a little bit of discussion about potential plans or if you guys just want me to jump into what we did. And I'll just say while, while the fellows are presenting, I'm going to, I'm going to answer chat questions as well. So if people want to, don't want to speak up and want to just type a chat question, we can do that too. Well, go ahead and go for it, AJ. Sure. So uh, on her, we proceeded with a revision L1 to the pelvis with S2AI screws. She had a L4 PSO, and then we did a posterior column osteotomy at L2-3 uh, to kind of give us that extra bit of correction of the lumbar lordosis. And then uh, she did have a little bit of compression at 3-4, so we did a 3-4 laminectomy. And so these are post-op films. Uh, obviously, we were able to correct her very well. Her PIL mismatches within uh, normal range for age 12.1. And then here's pre and post side by side. So, um, you know, this is a scenario where, you know, you could argue about multi-level posterior column osteotomies, but she has a robust fusion mass from four to one um, and really probably not going to get much out of the that, that segment. But uh, doing a PSO, you're able to get a lot distally in the construct and, uh, and save yourself the trouble of probably trying to loosen up every one of those levels distally. Can I ask two questions? Sure. And this is as a as an observer at our conferences because we see a lot of these cases. Um, the two questions that we see a lot in our practice is the use of um, anterior inner bodies to get more lordosis and stopping at the TL junction. Those would be my two questions. What do you think? What do you think, what do you think AJ? I was going to say here for the anterior uh, inner bodies. You know, I think you'd have to do osteotomies in the back before you do that. So you'd kind of be doing a back front back. Um, so maybe in this case, not, um, I don't know if that would be super helpful. And then I think here, you know, I think you could definitely argue going T10 to pelvis on this case. Um, but I think with an L4 uh, PSO, you're distal enough that going to L1 allows you to have appropriate uh, stability um, without having to cross the thoracolumbar junction. One, one thing to look at, if you look at the um, pre-op and post-op lateral x-rays, what's remarkable is how her thoracic spine has accommodated. So you can see she still had that mobility in the thoracic spine and has normalized her thoracic kyphosis. 
which I think is is real uh, important and to recognize that. Uh, if she had a rigid thoracic spine, then you'd probably want to consider going up a little further um, beyond the balance point, looking at the sagittal vertical axis. Uh, the other issue comes up when you said staged front, back, front. Uh, this is a case where I may have staged her, taken her hardware out, and actually done the osteotomies through the fusion mass, and then decide, once we regroup, do I think I can get her more lordosis at the lumbosacral junction with the osteotomies fused and anterior interbody uh, cages of some sort? So there's dozens of ways to, to address this. You've just got to figure out what's going to work best for the patient and what you can do best for them. AJ, what are some of the, there was a question, a good question about non-union. Um, so we didn't use, we didn't use multiple, you know, more than two rods. We didn't use inner bodies. Um, what kind of things have you, have you seen us or have you seen other others do to improve healing rates and, and lower the rate of non-union, which is certainly a big problem in PSO? Personally, I, I do it a little bit differently in this case. At first, I would do an ACR 2, 3, and 3, 4, which is very simple to do. And then you do a posterior fixation and basically... Once you've done the ACR, the, the surgery is done. You just have to put the rod posteriorly with, uh, without the small Smith bead osteotomies. Now, I, if, I I, do a, if I do a PSO on these cases, uh, now uh, with the high rate of uh, rod breakage, we see, and it's been published by the uh, San Francisco's group that uh, has at least 15% of rod breakage uh, in the adult spine deformity. What I do is I use uh, uh, six rods. I use uh, two satellite rods at the PSO level, and then I span with uh, uh, two rods uh, on, the t on each uh, side, going to with uh, a two pelvic bolts on each side. So that makes a total of six rods. And like this, hopefully, uh, this, uh, I don't see any rod breakage after PSO. So you understand two small satellite rods, and yeah. let's in your case, you've done a, a PSO at L4, so that would be a satellite rod between L3 and L5. So to get a correction, and then afterwards on each side, two other rods running from the pelvis up uh, to, to uh, when well, you stop at L1, uh, to, to others. It's, it's very rigid. So on the top, I stagger them. So you don't have the um, uh, too, too rigid fixation. But at least uh, uh, I don't see any rod breakage uh, in, in the long term. Great. Yeah, my counter my counterpoint to the ACR high in the lumbar spine is that I don't, you know, I, 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 the, the, the two thirds of your lumbar lordosis should come from four to one and correcting major lumbar lordotic deformity in the upper lumbar spine is a bit unnatural, in my opinion. Um, I one. agree with you, but you, you, you correct a lot between a three and four. You've corrected at four. So you, you're talking about the one one the one centimeter difference. So I'm yeah. not sure it makes a big difference in the, uh, I agree, it's better to have the whole lordosis between L4 and S1, but you get a lot between L3 and S1 putting an SCR. You put a 20 degree or even a 30 degree cage from a lateral approach at uh, between uh, L3 and L4 and the surgery is basically done. Nice. Why don't we, um... Yeah, I think I think just this just underscores there's a lot of a lot of different ways to handle deformity. I, I I don't find myself doing a lot of PSOs anymore. Some people are doing them all the time. I think my favorite scenario to do them is through a solid fusion mask because a the healing rate is much higher than it is through a virgin um, area. Uh, you already have a very robust fusion mask to decorticate through and to do the osteotomy in a precision way through. Um, and also just if I'm forced through because of a fixed deformity, then I'll, and there's a, there's a very, very large mismatch, then certainly a PSO is a good thing to do. I, I am much more commonly doing multi-level posterior osteotomies and inner body work as you, as you suggested. So I think AJ wants to show up a case of some, some, some sort of approach like that. So yes. let's, let's let him move on to that. Yes. Uh, next case. Right and just go through this kind of quick, AJ. Sure. So, 37 year old male, similar story, three to five lamy fusion, 
multiple years previously now is having progressive back pain, has some symptoms of claudication, but really hunched forward posturing um, has failed conservative management. They're full strength. They do have some right anterior thigh, uh, subjective decrease, some station and some pain with range of motion. So yeah. X-rays for this patient, previous three to five, uh, decompression, fusion, you see lateral ascesis at two, three, degenerative scoliosis. Uh, here we have uh, pelvic parameters again noted and see of a 35 uh, degree mismatch. Uh, I apologize, I wrote the SVA a little bit too early, but you can see pitch forward posturing SVA is positive 25 and a little bit of a coronal shift uh, if we're being extremely uh, specific there. Uh, so here, uh, MRI cuts, you can see they have multi-level uh, stenosis, 12, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3. Uh, and here, I just wanted to note on the uh, CT, they do have good fusion through the previous uh, levels, but there's vacuum disc phenomenon uh, approximately at multiple levels, which uh, we'll kind of discuss as a reason for why we decided to go posterior column osteotomies uh, in the next slide. So this is a prior three to five fusion patient has low back pain, urgent claudication, lumbar radiculopathy in the setting of severe spinal stenosis, degenerative scoliosis, and a significant sagittal imbalance. Uh, for the sake of time, we will uh, defer the plan discussion and go straight to what we did. So we did a T10 to pelvis, uh, <clears throat> posterior column osteotomies at one, two, uh, two, three, and then at five, one, we did a T lift at five, one to increase uh, our uh, fusion um, and then laminectomies from 12 to uh, S1. So here are the uh, post-op. Uh, so AJ, why is this? Why is this patient still? Why is this patient still a little bit positive? Uh, you know, I mean, you leave people a little bit for aged, matched, uh, normal, and they're in the upper, low end of. I think I said sixty-seven, so they're kind of right where they should be um, overall. Well, I'll, I'll give you that, but but I think. You know, if you go back, go back to the pre-op. Do we have the pre-op? You know, I, I think it's it's um, that thoracic spine is arguably more kyphotic afterwards. So this is sort of the definition of radiographic PJK, not PJF. It's not a fracture. There's not a ligamentous injury. But go ahead, back to your. I think I have a, a side by side of pre and post. Yeah. And, and, and same remark, well, why you didn't consider just doing an a lift uh, 5-1 with a hyperloaded cages? It's, uh, and then the posteriorly, you only have to put the rods in. You do a small Smith Peter. Uh, yeah, I've changed all my practice. I hardly do a PSO anymore. Uh, anytime I see a, 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 a disc that's not fused, I go for it anteriorly. My, if it's L5-S1 or 4-5, uh, or I go anteriorly, anteriorly. And above, I go from the lateral side. And you get a beautiful correction just with a very simple surgery. But yeah. I mean, it's, 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 what you've done is perfectly nice, but I, I find just uh, instead of just picking around the draw, just uh, doing extensive PSO and the scar tissue and everything, which is uh, drives me crazy, I do it when I have no other choice. Uh, but, and if we look at the length of the surgery, as a matter of fact, I go faster uh, doing uh, ACR or uh, with the anterior surgery and then the posterior fixation in one stage than to do a, a PSO in the scar tissue that takes me uh, the whole day and uh, to, to, to get it right. The, yeah. the one thing I'd add to Vincent's comments is if you are going in front, make sure you assess the patient's hips because if they've got any element of fixed flexion contractors, you're, you're still doomed to, being, to having a patient in positive sagittal balance. So some of these patients need their hips taken care of first. Some of them even need anterior capsular releases and so is tendon releases in order to get them back balanced. I agree with you. That's a very good comment. But one of the things is so now we have the EOS film. Uh, we, we, it's easy to see if you have a flexion contracture. Uh, you, you look at the pelvis, the pelvic tilt, the axis of the femur to see if you're retroverted. You see the hip extension reserve or not. If the patient is using his hip extension reserve or not, and you know uh, with your clinical examination if they have a hip flexion contract or not. Before the EOS, it was very challenging to know in a flat back patient whether he had the hip flexion contract or not. Now with the EOS, you just look at the EOS film and you say, it's not, he's using uh, his hip extension reserve to maintain this. He doesn't have a hip flexion contracture. So I find it very useful to have an EOS uh, uh, picture for this uh, complex uh, spine deformity. Great. 
but um yeah i think i think what you were driving at here aj is um is really the the different kind of setting when a multi-level posterior base osteotomy versus a three column osteotomy might be more and more more or less helpful so exactly this one thank you thank you for that. Columns versus tso in the first case well, why don't we move on to um i think nick shepherd's going to present now hold on nick are you presenting the tumor or are you presenting the dgen case uh, I'll be presenting the tumor case. Can I, can I, can I, I want to have plenty of time to talk about the DGEN case. Can we do that first? Barrett, are you able to, or do you need a little bit more time? No, I'm ready to go. All mm -hmm. right. Why don't we do that? Uh, take over your real mute. Is that working? Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Barrett Sullivan, one of the other uh, Rush Spine fellows. Um, I've got a case here, uh, a degenerative case. Um, thing to talk about. So this is a 66-year-old uh, male who went into clinic with a two-year history of uh, back and bilateral extremity pain. Uh, his uh, history is notable for a uh, surgery performed a year prior that briefly alleviated his symptoms, but he had a cough. Uh, just a cough, he said, a month after surgery, and then he had an acute recurrence of all of his pain and lower extremity symptoms. Um, basically, walking caused uh, numbness and pain down his legs, reduced walking tolerance, um, pain was slightly worse with extension, and he'd actually been to a chiropractor and gotten physical therapy. Medical history is notable for Parkinson's disease, and the surgery performed prior uh, was a T-lift at 3-4, and again, that was one year prior to presentation. On exam, he had a normal... Uh, strength and sensory uh, evaluation. Um, these were his films on presentation and clinics. So you see the prior pedicle screw instrumentation at what would be uh, L3 and L4. You see the inner body cage uh, there. Um, as we go to flexion extension films, uh, you can see that, you know, there's obviously a problem here. Uh, there's instability, the implants are loose um, and there's hardly any L4 uh, residual uh, visible. Um, so as we go to a CT evaluation, you can see, um, you know, several uh, cuts through the moves and sagittal cuts here. Uh, the cage, uh, and there's obviously a non-union. There is a collapse of L4. The cage is retropulsed into the canal at this point. Uh, as we look at the uh, coronal CT scan, we see there's a sagittal split uh, in L4 um, and a lateral ascesis as well. As we go to the axials, again, you see the L3 is pretty much intact. L4 has split. The cage is retropulsed. And as you go down to L5, L5 again is intact. Let's look at the MRIs. As we look down at the MRIs, uh, you can again see at each level, uh, as you expect with the, uh, the sagittal split of L4 and the retropulsion of the screw, there's significant canal stenosis at the side of the prior laminectomy that then uh, resolves itself as we get more distal. So ultimately, we have a sagittal split fracture of L4, a pseudoarthrosis of the prior T-lift and malposition of the cage causing spinal stenosis. Uh, so, you know, would you like me to just go ahead and launch into the what we did, or do you want to talk here a little bit first? We can, we can give people a chance to say how they would handle this. I think maybe go back to your CT. That was a really good couple cuts that kind of showed. Uh, you know, if I can just say the only two good things are that uh, his retroperitoneum is virgin and he doesn't have uh, circumferential calcification of his vessel. So um, you've still got a way to get there that you haven't been before. But that's about the only good things. <laughs> yeah. And the, Park and the Parkinson's the boot. Right. I think uh, vibration does assist infusion, doesn't it? So maybe the Parkinson's will help. This is actually, uh, it's an interesting, it, you can't really tell, but this is an expandable metal T-lift. Um, I don't know how much of that sagittal split was created at the initial expansion. You just don't know. Every device has a little bit of a different power behind the expansion, so. Well, you know, there's only one thing more biomechanically ill-advised than a, than a minimally invasive T-lift cage. It's an expandable minimally invasive T-lift cage. <laughs> So I, we, we brought this case because we addressed it and I think kind of a pretty unique way um, 
totally agree that um, anterior corpectomy through virgin territory, through retroperitoneal approach is a really good way to do this. Um, why don't, um, if anybody has any other comments, why don't, um, if not, why don't we, uh, why don't we bury, why don't you go, go through what, what our thought process and what our, what our approach was. Um, so obviously, you know, there is malposition instrumentation, there is, uh, you know, the, the pseudoarthrosis, the lack of anterior, uh, stability. Uh, so you're gonna have to, before, you know, if, although you're gonna have to do something anterior to you know, reconstruct the anterior column, you also have these malposition and, you know, non-viable implants posteriorly, they're gonna have to come out. So I think the logic in proceeding to the OR here was that you're gonna have to get the old implants out, then do whatever you're gonna do to reconstruct anteriorly, you know, the L4 corpectomy basically, and then, you know, go back and put your instrumentation in posteriorly. So depending on how you approach this, maybe a, a two to three uh, position uh, surgery. Um, obviously it's nice if you can cut down on that. I think this was a very interesting uh, way that this was handled. This was before my time uh, here with Dr. Coleman, but here's our post-op films, his, his post-op films. Um, showing uh, that, you know, there was an L4 corpectomy with placement of an expandable anterior cage, uh, followed by uh, the instrumentation from um, L2 down to the pelvis west with a S2 AI screws. Uh, again, a satellite uh, screw across or satellite rod across the corpectomy. Uh, and a laminectomy was also performed from uh, L2 down to L5. Obviously, the old cage and old instrumentation was removed. This was follow-up films a year after. Um, something that you can't tell from the, you know, the imaging here is how this is exactly performed. And this was done on a single position surgery, uh, starting prone, open midline posterior incision, removal of the old instrumentation, uh, decompression, uh, followed by uh, airplaning the bed 30 degrees, uh, and uh, uh, lateral uh, retroperitoneal anterior approach. So the you know prone. Uh, X lift uh, to form the corpectomy, uh, which allowed kind of simultaneous working uh, with the anterior and posterior columns to free everything up, get the correction, expand the cage, uh, and then uh, lock it in with the posterior instrumentation. So um, pretty interesting. This was a, a couple of years ago too. So yeah, I thought I thought what what was particularly useful here was the simultaneous access through a transoas corpectomy approach. Um, and an open posterior approach. We were actually able to kind of like through the revision decompression, tamp that cage into the, can't tamp the T-lift cage into the, the lateral defect and like pull it out through the lateral wound. Um, it was very powerful being able to simultaneously work in both operative fields. Um, Plus you saved two whole position changes. Right. So yeah, saved a lot of time. It's a great use of that technique. Um, Barrett, anything, any pearls on handling Parkinson's revisions in, in general? Do you have any, anything that you, that comes to mind about why Parkinson's patients are different or how to handle them? I mean, um, maybe there's a really good comment by Mark about, um, you know, the stage of Parkinsonism being an independent predictor of outcomes and complications. Totally agree. This is a I can't say I know the stage staging system off the top of my head, but this guy was a high grade. I mean, he was, he has a obvious motion, motion abnormality and is very cachectic and high risk. I, I think you have a beautiful result. It's a very, very nice reconstruction. I, I would have done slightly differently staying posteriorly because it was uh, most reduced and then uh, doing uh, an anterolateral and no leaf uh, corpectomy and tip psoas. How, how do you avoid when you're doing a, uh, uh, X lift and you're doing copectomy at the level of uh, uh, L4 to have a, a nerve uh, uh, issue because it's one thing to do a, a one a, a one level case, but when you, it comes to a copectomy where you have to remove the thing, it's a lot of uh, retraction on the psoas muscles. And so, how, how do you, how do you, what are your tricks to uh, through an X lift approach at L4 copectomy uh, to avoid any uh, neuropraxy or any uh, uh, plexopathy of the lumbar plexus. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, what I do, what I do is I try to create three separate um, docking episodes. 
you know, so much as in, as we do in cervical corpectomies, we, I go and I dock and do a discectomy above and below. Now that's like a typical case. This is obviously a little different because the disc spaces are sort of blocked by the sagittal split migrated fragments. Um, but I try to, I try to do a simple lateral inner body above below. And then I, I let the retractor rest and I do my corpectomy last, um, by controlling the segmentals and, and I try to work efficiently and just try not to have the retractors open too long, but just like, just like a, a high cervical corpectomy, it's easier to do the corpectomy um, than it is to do discectomies, right? Because once you start taking away bone, you have all sorts of access angles into that defect. Um, so it just make it just makes it a little bit more efficient. But the concern the concern is real about plexopathy with prolonged. I mean, these are these are not short, obviously short twenty minute retractor times for a, a corpectomy. So. Hey, Matt, um, this is Rod. That's a beautiful reconstruction. Um, what do you use? Do you use what neuromonitoring do you use? I just did a case like this last night. Nice. Um, well, um, are you saying like in general for the, for the whole patient or, or to doc? And to no, no, sorry. Just for in general, for doing, sorry, um, going back to Vincent's question about the lumbar plexus. Um, do you use, uh, did you use um, like uh, intraoperatively to, to map the plexus? Yeah, so I use, I use Nuvasiv to do this case. Okay. Um, and so obviously they have their, their integrated sure. neuromonitoring. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, again, I try to, I try to treat each docking episode as its own, yeah. as its own episode. And I just, I do it the way you'd normally do it. Yeah. Um, that's a beautiful result. And, um, I, you know, I think, um, it, and you took, it looks like you took, did you take a lot of bone from the back and then go from the front and then go back from the back? Exactly. So I, I put okay. the screws in under navigation. Actually, we have some navigation pictures. I'm not sure. Um, 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 they're kind of interesting. I, I navigate the screws. I actually docked, I actually docked the lateral portion under navigation which I'd never done before, but I figured since yeah. I was already up and running with the nav, it was, it was a good thing to do. And it was actually very intuitive. I could see every, see the psoas really well. I could see where the body was really well. So, um, but yeah, posterior first, revise the decompression, saw like the head of the cage. I was able to tamp off that. Obviously take all the screws. Yeah. I, I took my screws up and got better screws in. And then I was actually able to like provide screw expans expansion across the screws to facilitate the opening to accept the cage. So again, the simultaneous back and forth was pretty powerful. Yeah, beautiful job. That's not an easy, you know, that's that's a very difficult um, corpectomy and then to get the cage out and everything. Cause you know, if you go anterior, it's, it's very difficult to get that out because of the vessels. So I think, I think you did a beautiful job on this. Thank you. All right. Uh, why don't we show, let's, let's do the tumor case quickly because it's a pretty simple point. And then I know I want Greg to show a case too. All right. So we'll try to move through this pretty quickly. I'm Nick, uh, the third spine fellow here at Rush. So this case is a 79 year old male, uh, known diagnosis of thoracic chordoma that was status post resection um, and about 25 fractions of uh, radiotherapy and a couple uh, doses of proton therapy, maybe 10, 11 years ago prior to presentation. Um, but he presented with about one month of significant unrelenting back pain as well as some left lower extremity radicular symptoms. He also noted some early gait changes but had no significant bowel or bladder symptoms. Past medical was significant for AFib and he was on anticoagulation. Um, otherwise, his neurologic exam was normal, no evidence of uh, significant hyperreflexia. Importantly, Nick, this is an intralesional. So these were the images that he presented with. Um, you know, you can see his status post T9 to L2 posterior spinal fusion. Um, looks like they did a T12 chordoma resection um, with uh, satellite rods and then cross links, and they spanned probably two above, two below. And this was his preoperative MRI. Um, so you can see that he has recurrence of the chordoma, uh, you know, localized centrally around T11, T12. 
Um, but this is associated with high grade or significant uh, epidural uh, compression, Bilski 2, maybe Bilski 3 even, um, with near complete compression of his, um, of his canal um, at the affected levels with that recurrent choidoma. So in terms of the diagnosis, um, a recurrent T11-12 choidoma, um, you know, working through some of the options, you know, it's, you know, do you, is it something that you would want to approach non-operatively, maybe do uh, another dose of radiation? Again, he's had 25 fractions of um, uh, stereotactic radiation at this point. Um, do you consider doing some sort of intralesional uh, resection, a separation type surgery, um, you know, likely followed by, uh, you know, a second round of radiation? Or, you know, again, this is a chordoma, um, you know, is it something that you would want to treat with wide end block resection? Um, again, likely followed by radiation therapy. So, you know, with this case, you know, there are some considerations. This is a previously irradiated tumor. It is a chordoma um, and it's a recurrent setting. Um, again, there is significant um, uh, epidural uh, compression, Bilski 2, Bilski 3, um, and his SIN score is about 12, uh, which is on the cusp of, of instability just based on the location um, for that tumor. So, I guess we can, you know, pause here, Dr. Coleman, or if you'd like me to proceed, we can kind of go. Yeah, I mean, with, we, uh, you know, we, done we, from an we, standpoint. we, we confirm the, the, the tumor diagnosis right, with a biopsy and we, and we restaged and there was localized disease. We thought a lot, you know, we talked a lot about this, this case with, with a bunch of people around the country and, you know, Cordoma, unfortunately your first shot at Cordoma is your best shot. It's a very fastidious slow growing, but very pesky local problem. Uh, metastases happen, but they're rare, more rare. So, you know, the, the mantra is wide end block surgery, but in a case like this, um, there really is not a good wide end block option at this point. So I, I agree, Nick, you know, you can, you don't, you don't want to give him the worst of all worlds and A, not help oncologically, and B, give him a bunch of complications with surgery by doing another big intralesional surgery, which obviously hor horrendously failed the first time. So there's not a lot of good options for this. I, I showed it to illustrate that, um, you know, a couple points. Number one, intralesional surgery is not all the same. Uh, we were, when we did this case, we actually did recommend and, and execute surgery for him. But this, this is the kind of surgery that has to be, you know, bilateral, uh, extra cavitary, um, kind of costo type approach. You have to get circumferential decompression of the cord. You have to get into the posterior body wall and you really have to be thorough. So it's, it's intralesional, but it's more than just a scrape out. It's a very, very thorough gross total resection. And, um, and then, of course, we always have the option to, to use radiotherapy. I, want, I thought it was a nice case to illustrate that, that radiotherapy can be perturbed by large metal implants and screws and rods. Proton therapy uh, uh, for consolidation. This guy's getting protons postoperatively. Um, but, but but proton therapy does not like metal at all. So I've even taken out titanium rods and put peak rods. It's the only time I've ever put a peak rod in, I'm happy to say, but I, I put peak rods in just to provide stability and allow for radiation. So we have to remember radiolucency of implants um, and quality of revision tumor decompression. I think those are the main learning points. Um, do you have any post-op? I think he had a recent post-op uh, MRI showing the yeah. So, you know, kind of as you discussed, he did just try to go, it was, you know, an attempt at a wide end block excision, you know, most likely intralesional, just given the extent of that tumor. Um, and it was, you know, done through a costo with an 11, 12 corpectomy using an expandable cage, um, revision laminectomy above and below, and then, um, you know, revision fusion from nine to two. So these are recent post-operative images. Um, and I think, you know, more impressively, I would say is probably this post-operative MRI. Uh, you can see that there was good circumferential decompression. Um, you know, it, comparing this, I don't have a good, I don't have a slide that's comparative images, but um, you know, if you recall from you know a couple slides ago with essentially Bilski three cord compression at this level, uh, you can see that there is now significant anterior decompression. Um, you know, at the site of that wide excision. Um, 
So I think, you know, in terms of goals of surgery, as you were just, just discussing, um, you know, I think this is probably, you know, as, as good of a, a shot as he, you know, will likely have. And as you mentioned, he is going to be undergoing proton therapy. Um, he's just trying to find a, a site that, um, you know, will be convenient for him since it's not readily available here. Thanks, Nick. Linda, can we go five minutes over so we can show one more case or do we have a hard stop at eight? Uh, there's no hard stop. People might just bail, but that's yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. Let's show one more case. And if people need to log off, that's fine. Great. Greg, is that okay? Are you happy to do yeah, that? Yeah. No, of course. My wife can handle the five kids at home right now. <laughs> Hello. Let's see. All right, thanks for having us back, guys. Matt, great talk. You know, my, one of my biggest actually difficulties, I feel like, is sometimes just diagnosing a pseudoarthrosis. Now that the overwhelming, you know, MIST lifts happening with med metallic inner bodies, it's almost impossible to have time to tell. Is it a true pseudoarthrosis? So that's, you know, if you guys have any tips and tricks later on, I'd love to hear them. Um, but this is more revision surgery, a rush. You know, it's almost weird if I don't see someone that's had surgery before. Uh, this is someone who had a previous L1 to S1 uh, laminectomy six months prior. It was complicated by a neurotomy, um, but she came in because after relatively quickly after surgery, I had severe low back pain. There were also ridiculous symptoms, but her back was just unrelenting to the point where she was wheelchair bound by the time I saw her. It had only been six months, and it was a very uh, swift decline. You can see here, she most likely had a degenerative scoliosis that was treated with an open laminectomy. Um, multiple levels and the bony resection you can notice on the left side of the screen has definitely caused some instability. I'm assuming that there was more of a, you know, a milder sweeping curve prior and then following this, it increased. The CT scan really showed the amount of bony resection. So you see the facets almost at every level, three, four, four, five, five, one, were you know, partially or completely resected. And then there were pars fractures at nearly every level. So uh, beforehand, just looking at revision surgery in general, um, I'm looking at preoperative imaging in my mind, okay, I see a significant amount of the problem. There's fractures throughout, but what is the, what does the bony anatomy still look like? And you can see there's still pedicles, L2, L3, L4 is okay. L5, there still seems to be a place where I could place screws through safely. Um, and I have a good bony corridor, L4 being the worst. Then I think, okay, um, like Matt talked about before, is there an area where there was inadequate decompression? And when I look at the MRI scan, overall centrally, it was wide open, obviously varying degrees of foraminal stenosis with the, uh, with the listhesis throughout the lumbar spine, but centrally, there was no significant compression. So with this patient, just kind of keep it going, was more that she had multi-level instability, multiple pars fracture, previous thyrotomy, no severe central stenosis, or mostly multi-level foraminal stenosis. So all this points more to me, can I stay away from the midline elements posteriorly and move toward a more anterior column to help support her um, as her main issue is just uh, the inability of each segment to remain stable through the fractures. When I looked at this case, you know, I'm thinking in my mind, what is most likely the most difficult level? I think we've become you know, overall very facile with lateral inner bodies. So L1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, um, usually there isn't a whole lot of difficulty to place these. L4, 5 still is the level where it's relatively difficult in these severe degenerative You try to come anteriorly, and you can see on that MRI screen, the, uh, the, the vessels are all over the place. Can I go anti psoas not quite certain. Then if we go laterally, even if I'm able to get through that so as adequately, not have to retract the vessels to uh, the uh, the nerves too uh, badly, the actual spatial landing zone is very small. So will I be able to appropriately, uh, you know, reduce this or fix one of the main levels that she has with an inner body? Um, my thought is okay. And I'll go anteriorly, but also at L45, would I be able to reach this from a lateral approach? And I can see here. I look, you know, I draw across the iliac crest and I can see that I can clearly get to it from a lateral approach if I need to. Planning wise, you know, just thinking for those surgeons who are just deciding, you know, percutaneous fixation or open fixation, I'm on mind, I'm thinking which way are the, is, is the spine twisting in each segment. When there's an open lamy defect, it's relatively difficult to determine exactly where the pedicles are, especially if you don't have navigation, if you're at a hospital, it's just fluoroscopy. 
So I'm thinking, okay, which way do I have to tilt and what am I looking for when I'm looking on fluoro in order to place uh, my percutaneous screws appropriately? So I go into this one thinking, you know, obviously I think any degenerative setting, you go in with a plan A and a plan B. What am I going to be doing? What do I hope to achieve? And then what ends up happening, you know, throughout the case? Am I able to achieve it or do I need to switch to something else? My goal was, again, to start off with what I thought was the hardest area, which was L4-5 and L5-S1 uh, with A-lift. And then go lateral on our bodies, L1-2, 2-3-4, two, two, three, three, in that order. And then perfectly a screw fixation, L1 to S1. Um, from the lateral inner body approach, I try to go to the highest levels first. I found that initially I would just climb up the spine, L5-S1, L4-5, L3-4, and I would further push L1-2 up, making it even increasingly difficult to reach that L1-2 level, having to sometimes go uh, you know, in between the, the ribs and, and moving lung out of the way, as opposed to initially addressing it because of the coronal tilt, I'm able to access it without having to retract the lung. And then plan B, also keeping in mind and making sure I have everything ready, um, how else would I approach it if I was unable to attain one of the segments as is. As I progress as a surgeon, I've seen, you know, uh, like Matt was performing single position surgery, I was uh, able to hope, you know, hopefully achieve this in a single position with my uh, access surgeon being very talented now at performing lateral access um, through an anterior approach. So we did a Anterior uh, went after L4-5 and L5-S1 first, and it actually helped take the vessels down um, away from the spine and access L4-5 with not significant difficulty. And then I went from the same, you know, keeping the patient in the same position, performing the lateral inner bodies with the final product uh, being this. The nice part was, as you saw initially, it wasn't a true, you know, sagittal imbalance case. This was more just a instability case, multiple levels fractures, just giving this patient stability. Then also, like you mentioned before, do we need to cross the thoracal lumbar junction? And that I'm not, I'm still uncertain about for this patient. Their laminectomy defect stopped well below it. And I, I didn't feel that she had a healthy disc at L1-2 that she would be okay. The, the far right picture is her one-year post-op and L1-2 is still, has still remained intact. Um, so if any, uh, any questions about the operation itself? I mean, you, you made lemonade out of lemons here. You know, there's uh, a lot of good planning. It's just disappointing that in this day and age, someone would destabilize the spine and not recognize it um, in doing a decompression. So, it was a massive defect. If you really could scroll through, they just took the facets down at every level with, without instrumentation. It's, it's shocking to me, but it definitely, it's not the first one I've seen like that. Great result. My old chairman would say, you made chicken salad out of chicken, something else. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to thank everybody for having us and for, for tuning in. Great job, fellows. Uh, thank thank you. you, Rush guys. You did great. We appreciate great, it. Great yeah. cases. Good right. job. Have a good evening, good everybody. Good night, everyone. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks. Have a good one. Hey, good night. Jay, see you soon. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. See you all. See you all.